you dream of a classroom where learning is natural? Can we inspire students to lifelong learning? What exactly is the purpose of an education? Inspiring students to be curious, independent, creative, innovative, deep thinking, confident, proactive, collaborative, determined, educated. Rise to the challenge of changing the world. This is teaching. This is learning. This is who we are. Welcome to the Tabletop Inventing Podcast. Is it possible that questions are more powerful than answers? What is the ultimate question? What are the Latin roots of the word educate? Listen in for a deep discussion about these answers in today's podcast. Hey there, Innovation Nation. You are in for quite a ride today. Strap on your oxygen tanks because today we're going deep. Language was invented to ask questions. Answers may be given by grunts or gestures, but questions must be spoken. Humanness came of age when man asked the first question. Social stagnation results not from lack of answers, but from the absence of the impulse to ask questions. This quote by Eric Hoffer has become one of my new favorites. Our guest today, Ed Kless, mentioned it, and I had to go find it afterwards. Hoffer basically says that curiosity is the engine of human social structures. Curiosity in this context is not just following random synapse firings, but rather the pursuit of intelligent, thoughtful impulses of the human heart. From these impulses spring the desire to understand others, to understand the world around, and perhaps in its most powerful form, to understand ourselves. I've said it here on the podcast before, but it always bears repeating. Answers are short-lived and uninspiring, but a burning question can fuel curiosity and even a whole life's work. Curiosity about numbers and burning questions about how they behave have driven mathematicians such as Paul Erdős to create a rich and vibrant understanding of math. Burning questions about how the most basic elements of the universe interact drove physicists such as Erwin Schrödinger and Richard Feynman and the ubiquitous Albert Einstein to develop a robust theory of matter and energy along with a rich understanding of their underlying constituents. Questions always involve a quest, and quests are rich and varied things which almost never end up the way we imagined them in the beginning. I'm not one of those who believe in the journey is the destination, but the journey certainly makes for great stories and wonderful memories once we reach a destination, and for some of us, the journey often calls us back to the open road of life to ask ever deeper questions or perhaps just to find some other interesting destination. No matter your disposition in life, questions and the pursuit of their answers are at the core of what it means to be human, as Hoffer suggests. Today, Ed Kless and I will delve into deep water. Ed is a fellow podcaster, he is a businessman, he is a philosopher. He is a thespian. Let's find out some more about this fascinating guest. My guest today is Ed Kless. Ed has a weekly radio show on the Voice of America called The Soul of Enterprise. He is a senior fellow at Verisage, which is a think tank dedicated to removing the billable hour. We'll get more into that. Uh, he also works with Sage, and he is the senior director of partner development and strategy there. So. Ed, tell us a little more about yourself. Yeah, there's a lot there, huh? Uh, let, let's start at the top. The, it's Voice America, and I have been doing for almost a year now a weekly talk radio show with my friend and colleague at the Veris Age Institute, which I'll come back to in a second, Ron Baker. And our radio show, The Soul of Enterprise, is heard worldwide on Fridays at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. And the purpose of the show is really to explain that our belief that business and enterprise has a uh, spiritual, although not necessarily religious, uh, component to it, and that because we are our people and uh, we as people have a spiritual component, our business needs to be reflective of that. And, uh, one of the ways that we, we talk a little bit about that is the idea that, that we have these things called business transactions. Well, the word transaction means go, going beyond the action. So there's something something deeper, more metaphysical about 
the exchange of goods. And that basic thing is that value is created on both sides of that exchange and that we're both made better when we make a trade. If you buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks, you want the cup of coffee more than you want the $4, and Starbucks wants the $4 more than they want their cup of coffee, so it's beneficial to both groups. So that's the focus of the radio show. At the Verisage Institute, we've been dedicated to helping professional organizations, so lawyers, accountants, technologists, even to some extent advertising agencies as well, eliminate the billable hour as their primary pricing mechanism, and even more importantly, probably eliminate the timesheet as the costing mechanism inside the organization. And the reason for that is that we think that the only place that time spent should matter is in prison, and that we as <laughs> professionals, the value that w- of what we do is not in our effort but in our mind, in our knowledge, in our insight, and to try to measure that by the hour, whether you're doing that from a value perspective, a price perspective, or even a cost perspective inside the organization is really silly because you can't measure the value of a particular hour, right? Some hours have way more value than others. Some minutes have way more value than others. And to try to allocate costs based on this arbitrary 60-minute is basically akin to business astrology uh, because you're using this completely artificial mechanism. The the analogy that we use is basically you're trying to to measure the doneness of your turkey on Thanksgiving by plunging a ruler into it, uh, and it just is the wrong measurement mechanism. And then the third one, and, and perhaps the most important since that's why I get a paycheck every two weeks, is that I am the Senior Director of Partner Development and Strategy at SAGE. And what, what that role is to translate all of that corporate speak is I am a consultant to consultants. We sell most of our products, especially in the mid-market, through a, a network of business partners. And I work with those people on their business strategy, hence the idea of partner strategy. So I'm really a consultant to these consultants and helping them make their business better. So that's the a 30,000 foot of three different things that I do. <laughs> let's back up a little bit then. You tell us quite a bit about what you're doing right now. Let's let's back up and find out a little bit about how you got to this. So where should we start? Let's start with SAGE. What was the path from, well, I don't know, from college to SAGE? Well, it's an interesting one in that my my degree is in liberal studies. So basically, I, I majored in minors is really the way best way to describe that. I had three minors, uh, business administration, information systems, and, of course, theater arts. And if you ask me which one I use more and more from a day-to-day operations perspective, it would clearly be the theater arts hands down. I went to work after that for a accounting firm back on Long Island, where I'm originally from, having only had two accounting classes, but basically because I had this business administration and was not afraid of technology, they were willing to hire me in their, what was at the time called their management advisory services group and Mm -hmm. did consulting from my first day out of college, which is what I always wanted to do is some, some form of consulting work. And then from that went on to then work for another couple of organizations doing similar things and then finally be a founder in an organization in the, in the mid-1990s that was focused on what at the time was called accounting systems, what we now call ERP systems or, or back office solutions. And then did that for about 15 years, then sold my interest in that organization and 13 plus years ago went to work for Sage. So here I am. So it sounds like along the way, you picked up a lot of other skills and ideas. What were the mechanisms that you used to do that? I mean, did you did you go to classes? Did you uh, watch your colleagues? Uh, did you go to seminars? How did you pick up the extra yeah, skills? Yeah, all of the above and, and lots and lots of reading. I've been blessed with several fantastic mentors in my career, including my dad, who was a a Latin teacher, and not full time. He was a general management of a of a rolling door company, but did part time teaching of Latin in high school by us. And we're taught the importance of words. It was it's sort of like if you've seen that movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, where they have the <laughs> running running joke, you know, uh, throughout the movie. Give me a word, then I'll tell you how the origin is Greek. You know, the dad would do this. It was sort of like that in my house, only Latin. 
So my dad would talk about words, and we had dinner conversations about the original meaning of the word mortgage, which some of your listeners may know means death pledge. M-O-R-T is death, and uh, G-A-G-E is pledge. So when you take out a mortgage, you have a death pledge. And it's like, okay, that makes total sense. (laughs) And then, yes, I did, you know, obviously did college, but then some educational is part of my career development, but but I have to say that, that probably the best insight and learning that I've done has been from just talking with mentors and stumbling sometimes across some really fantastic books, not only just business books, but books about ideas and understanding what those things are. And now I guess that's morphed into things like spending time watching videos on YouTube because there's some great content out there. Uh, doing some classes on my iPad, uh, took one on cosmology uh, recently, and then not cosmetology, but cosmology, and then uh, just always being a, a lifelong learner. You know, the Latin, you know, going back to my dad here, but the Latin for educate means to lead out or to draw out. And I, I've always kind of come back to that understanding about education, that the idea is that we're really trying to, to draw out the meaning of what it means to be human because there's to me there's a moral component of of education and that's something that's got to be focused on so wow so you certainly started off with the meat and potatoes version of the english language and latin and got the full force of starting off an educational career did you find along the way that there were any particular people that stood out in your mind that that helped you figure out business and life and these other things I mean, you've already mentioned your dad who, who else might fit in that category Sure. You know, even a couple of professors back in college, not the least of whom I mentioned, my theater professor, who was just a very thoughtful guy and and understood the the classics, not only of of theater, but just of of all things education, and really had us, when we did scene study, we're really working on building character, but also understanding what it fully means to be a human being and how we can put ourselves in different positions. I also think back to a professor that I had in my one and only finance class. Michael Ulysses Schwartz was the guy's name, and he just was probably the best coach that I have ever had on the subject of critical thinking. He really led us through a process, and he wasn't imparting any specific knowledge on us per se, but just more of a way to learn, a way to ask questions, a a way to observe and which has impacted me to this day. It's funny, there's very few notebooks that I've saved from college, but one of them was from this guy's class. And it was really for one reason, a a two-page photo stat sheet of an exercise that he gave on the first day of class, which was a very high-level view at income statements and balance sheets for seven different companies. And what he said was, was, these seven companies are in these seven industries, and he listed the seven industries. And our assignment basically was by the end of the semester to be able to figure out which industry the company was based on just looking at the numbers on the financial statement. And he, this was he just on day one of the class. And we didn't return to it at all specifically until the last day of class. And when he started the conversation off was, okay, well, let's go back to this thing I gave you on day one, pull it out. Most people didn't have it with them because they had forgotten it. But he said, you should have absorbed all of this other stuff that we have learned about this class. You should now be able to go back and complete this worksheet. And I think I got five out of seven of them right. I did, did switch two up. But that was a, a really important learning experience for me that he had the foresight to really want to get us to be un, have an understanding of critical thinking, not just the specific material that we were going to cover. Wow. Well, you, you mentioned something specific, a specific skill that he taught you that I we think is particularly important. So maybe I'll ask you to unpack that a little bit. You said he helped you walk through the process of asking better questions. Yeah, and this has then become a lifelong passion of mine, which is understanding the art, because it's really an art, of asking more effective questions. One of my favorite quotes comes from a guy named Eric Hoffer, who is a self-taught philosopher. He was a longshoreman at the Port of San Francisco in the 50s or 60s and, and taught himself philosophy. And I'm paraphrasing his because I don't have it exactly correct, but this is close enough. He says, man came of age when he asked the first question. Answers may be given in grunts and points, but to ask a question requires our humanity. He said society suffers not from a lack of answers, 
but from a lack of the impulse to ask new questions. And that has, has always take, been extraordinarily profound. And it's, it's a lifelong pursuit that I have of understanding questions, including, by the way, discovering in a book about 10 years ago what this author, his name is Peter Block, refers to as the mother of all questions. Are you ready for the mother of all questions? Yes, please. The mother of all questions is, what is the question that if I had the answer would set me free? I like it. And he says that it's ultimately an unanswerable and imponderable question that we as people will think about for an entire lifetime and struggle with. And you'll never come to a definitive answer, but it will make your life better if you think about it on a regular basis. Well, my background is, is in physics. And as a physicist, you know, a researcher, answers are interesting, but they're only interesting for a very short period of time. A question, mm-hmm. on the other hand, can be engrossing, and positive, uh, almost addictive for a lifetime if you find the right question. Yeah, so I, maybe I found my question. This is Peter Block's, the mother of all questions. What is the question that if you had the answer would make you free? Well, a pretty good one at that. <laughs> it is, it is. Well, let's back up even a little further because one of the things that we like to dive into a little bit is you know, kind of how you got the drive and the goal to move forward in your life to a place where you can even ask a question like that. Because clearly, you know, someone could say that, you know, mouth that question to someone and you would have to be ready to hear it in order for it to mean something to you. So tell us how you got ready to hear questions like that. And let's start all the way back, I don't know, maybe in grade school. <laughs> wow. I haven't pondered grade school for quite some time other than to say that I think r- roughly after about fourth grade, I was relatively bored in school. I think that oh, I want to trace it back specifically to learning multiplication and division. Once I learned multiplication and division, there and after, everything regarding math was why are we moving so slow, right? Because I get, I get it. <laughs> and, you know, it, it come to find out later in life that the reason is is because – We have to teach to the least common denominator in school. I mean, we can't go so fast because I know that you've got it, Ed, but maybe half of you have got it, but the other half don't, and we can't really move on until the other half get it. So the half of you that get it, you keep drilling it, even though we know you got it. So in fourth grade, I mean, it's hard to put your mind around that particular answer. And so at that point, did you start to check out? Did you start to uh, read more? How did you cope with, with that frustration? I started to do other things, and, and curiously, one of the ways that I did that was I applied math to something that I also love, which is baseball. Doing math problems in school was a chore. Computing batting averages was a joy, and started reading more and more. And like I remember this little magazine called Baseball Digest, and I remember writing away for this book that this guy had written called The Baseball Abstract, which was an attempt at being a, having a scientific journal around the understanding of baseball numbers and statistics. This guy went on to become semi-famous. His name is Bill James. And if you've seen Moneyball, he is he's not one of the characters in Moneyball, but he's the guy that they talk about as being one of the founding members of what is called Saber Metrics. Saber is an acronym for the Society for American Baseball Research. And then metrics, of course, is just a suffix that means measurement. And he is the creator of some fascinating predictive indicators of how well uh, and what is the likelihood of of baseball players going on to have more productive careers through understanding what their numbers are. And I think that's what I did. I was bored in school (laughs) from a math perspective. So I took the stuff that I did know and applied it to something I loved. So you have this love of baseball and certainly an acuity for math. Were there other areas in school that you applied the same types of things? I mean, math is one of those unfortunate casualties of uh, having to learn specific facts over and over and over again. And so we, we drill it and drill it and drill it. But not every subject is like that. Did you find yourself having a similar, you know, oh, this is boring approach to other subjects you kind of went through grade school? Yeah, so through the rest of grade school, which is in my case, eighth grade. And then I went to high school at an all-male Catholic high school, uh, again, on Long Island, and that was highly competitive. And that's where things really, I think, started to click. This was a group of really smart kids. <laughs> and instead of being the first or second smartest in the class, I was now 10th smartest in the class, in a class room of, say, 40 students at a time. 
because we didn't have anything. We didn't worry about teacher-student ratio back then. 40 kids in a class was good. That was fine. <laughs> and was challenged then not only by the coursework, because it became much more in-depth, but then by the extracurricular activities that I then participated in when I got got into what we would call club, which was studies club, which was basically as model student government. We studied forensics and, and speech and debate in that and had model senates and model UNs and to try to get, get an understanding of international relations, you know, back in, the, of course, this is the height of the Cold War, so there was lots of interesting things happening. Of course, interesting is I had the almost a reversal of fortune then in that college then, for the most part, became like grammar school again, with, again, the exceptions that I just mentioned, my theater professor and my finance professor. There were a couple of other interesting courses that I took on literature and stuff, but for the most part, college was boring after a very challenging high school experience. Now, do you think that contributed all to, I'm not even sure how to think about this because I'm not sure how you think about it, so tell us a little bit. Like, You ended up having a degree in liberal studies, and you're Mm kind of indicating that you had sort of a nonplussed experience in college. I mean, do you think those things were related? Was it the environment? Was it the college you picked, or were you just not ready? Was it just not challenging enough? Like, how did that Um, occur? You know, and it's funny, college was great because I got a chance to be much more social <laughs> than I had been in, in high school. It was not hard, right? There were people who struggled in college. I did not struggle in college at all. I mean, I, if I showed up for class and paid attention and could take notes, it was not a struggle at all. Not a lot of challenges. So I breezed through it. But I had a good time, too. I mean, I, had, I, had, I, I wasn't one of these guys who, I, you know, I was taking it at one point, I remember, 21 credit hours in one semester and working 30 hour a week job. It wasn't challenging. It was a lot of fun. It was, I didn't get much sleep, but it was still a lot of fun. (laughs) Well, I was going to say, you know, 20 hour in credit hours plus 30 hours of an outside job makes for pretty short sleeping hours. (laughs) Yeah. But you still didn't feel challenged in that. Was it the depth of the questions they were asking and they, they were just really shallow? Was it, yeah, what was it about yeah, it that wasn't challenging? That's a, it's a good question. I, I, I think it was because I was so well-rounded coming out of high school from a core, what I guess was called core curriculum. I don't know if it still is at the time, core curriculum standpoint, that you know, going into a required COM 101 class to learn basic writing skills, I was like, seriously? <laughs> Like, and, and I can remember some classmates actually struggling with that. And I guess it was because their high school experience had been much different from mine and that they weren't challenged in high school. And now all of a sudden, yes, you know, spelling and grammar count. So that, I think, is one of the reasons. I also think, too, that the professors, for the most part, especially of those early classes that I took, they were treating most of the class like it was 13th grade, Right. And it wasn't until I started taking some of my more advanced classes where the conversations started to evolve, including like the one I mentioned about, you know, finance, where it was not just lecture, 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 but, hey, let's, let's approach this from a Socratic method. Let's have conversations about it. Those were the things that I really loved to do. And not every professor was that way, but I would have perhaps been better off going to a college had I known about it now that was purely Socratic. That would have been a better move for me, but honestly, I didn't even know such thing existed. (laughs) So let me dig in just a little bit to that, because I think I agree with your feeling about things. I had a similar experience in college, and I actually didn't feel challenged until I got to grad school. When I got to grad school, I suddenly felt, oh, wow, you know, because I went from being the top of my class to being at the bottom of the class, which is a really humbling experience to have to navigate. But there was something about having to answer a deeper question where there wasn't just one single answer. And do you think that was related to this, that the simplicity of the answers or the simplicity of the question had something to do with whether not this was challenging or not? I would say so. If the mode of learning is let's seek the answer and there is one answer and in a lot of in a lot of cases there is one right way to get to said answer, then I think that that becomes less challenging to plug in a formula. But what I found in business and what excited me about business and what still excites me about consulting and working with organizations is that it's much more complex. I mean, you know, I'm sidetracking this conversation in a different direction, but still lots of math in business, right? There's all kinds of facts and figures and numbers and marketing data and financial data. And I think, unfortunately, that many people get lulled into thinking that because there's a lot of numbers, it's therefore science. 
I guess the phrase for it might be kind of a logical positivism, right? This is, that since we have numbers, this is math, this is science. And business is not. It's art. It's spirit. It's understanding that entrepreneurship is about continuing the work of creation and coming up with something new and asking different questions. And it's not about seeking what the answer is. It's about what questions are we asking? So let me ask you a question about that. Have you found in your experience that some people gravitate to that need to create something new and other people don't? Yes, and it profoundly saddens me because I think that we all have the potential to be creators of something new. And when folks come to a decision, a decision point in their life where they're like, oh, I'm just figuring out here how to get by, it makes me profoundly sad because I think that the world is now missing something that could have been. That's not what I expected you to say, but I <laughs> think I agree, <laughs> actually. I don't know how much Kirk told you about us, but you know, we spend a lot of time working with teenagers, specifically around the idea of creating something new. They have a challenge. They actually mm -hmm. have to make it work. There are parameters for how they approach this, but fundamentally – we don't give them the answer. You know, there's a complexity of answers out there, and they have to pick the one that they think they can make work or the one they, they're most drawn to or excited about. And not every student finds meaning in that exercise. Some students find frustration because, you know, we didn't give them the answer. Like, we didn't tell them, okay, there is the answer. And my experience says it's not because that capability of seeing you know, a complexity of answers isn't possible, but that somehow the zest for finding those compelling questions has been trained out of them, maybe. Do you think it has to do with the fact that for most schooling, it is about getting X percent right, you know? <laughs> oh, and oh, believe me. <laughs> that, and therefore, then when you're in the environment that, hey, you know what, you can go about this project and it can be a complete disaster in terms of it not you getting to an outcome that you wanted or expected. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't learn from it. No, I would completely agree with that assessment. You mentioned the Socratic method. My ears perked up immediately. I'm not the natural educator in our business. My wife is the educator. You know, I'm the tech guy. I came to good teaching philosophy late in life. But she is amazing at it. And, you know, the idea of asking a good question and then allowing the students to fumble around and make a complete mess out of things and maybe come to an answer gives them a much deeper educational experience than giving them one answer they could go look up on YouTube or Wikipedia yep. or Google. And sorry, I, I actually just poisoned the well, so I should just <laughs> ask the question. That we have two questions we normally end with. Sorry if I'm springing them on you. I'll just jump right in. The first one is in the digital world where we do have Google, Wikipedia, YouTube, mm -hmm. you know, there are lots of ways to use that. In that environment with those tools, I mean, what does it mean now to be, quote, educated? Like what does educated mean in that context? I'll go back to my Latin example, which is, you know, educate means to draw out or to lead out. It's, so it, it still means the same thing that it meant when Socrates was walking the earth is that it's because there is this moral component to, to education as opposed to just training, by the way. I hate, I hate, and this is a side note, I'm sorry, but I, I hate <laughs> the word training. I hate it. I hate it, especially in a business context, because Horses and dogs are trained. People are educated. And when the use of the word training is demeaning, and the way that I usually express it, and I apologize that this is crass, but I think it really sums the point up, is would you want your 15-year-old daughter to go to sex training or sex education? <laughs> and clearly it's education, right? Because there's a moral component and we want to draw out. We want to lead out. We want to get, we want to pull out of what is inside of all of us, that creativity, that spark. And that's what it means to be educated now. That's what it means to be educated then. It's just really cool that we can do some of that drawing out and share it with people instantaneously across the globe. That's amazing. You are the right person to ask this question. I have not had the opportunity to ask this question previously, but maybe I could have. Do you suppose that the word educated has been mm -hmm. abused in our society? Yes, mostly by educators. <laughs> and I don't mean that in a demeaning way, especially to your wife. But what I fear that it has come to is I am the educator. I instill this in you, right? I'm putting it into you. 
as opposed to drawing it out, lead out. The word means lead out, draw out, not put in. And unfortunately, the professionalism of education has become about, well, what do we put into these kids? And maybe this, you know, maybe I'm now solving my problem from fourth grade. My, my big challenge with education as it exists today is that it's based on a, the wrong model, right? The schooling system is based on the factory model. It looks like a very slow-moving factory. You go in to one side of the building, you start in kindergarten, you work your way year after year down the one hallway, then you come back the other hallway, and then we kick you out to the finishing plant, right? So it's a slow-moving factory where you are instilled in part where this is imparted on you, like a car going down an assembly line, and we're putting things in, right? But that's not at all what it's supposed to be. And the premise is this that somebody born in a particular year has the same desire and thirst for knowledge and the same way of thinking about things as other people who were born in that same year. And while gross and fine motor control is correlated in perhaps to the age of 10, after at the age of 10, intellectual ability and curiosity has nothing to do with the year you were born but because the system is based on, well, we keep the people, all of the people who were born in this year together, at least until they're 18, together. That's, that's madness. Wow. I can tell that you and I could probably talk for another hour on this one. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to sidestep just a little. <laughs> yeah, sure. And sure. we'll wrap this up, and perhaps you and I can talk for a few more minutes afterwards. The last question we always ask is more of a philosophical question, but you've already had a, a philosophical answer to this one, so this will probably be related. But the last question we always ask is, what is the purpose of an education? And I could guess at the answer, but I would, <laughs> to, I would love yeah, to have you just I, give I, me I what, what your answer is. Yeah, I'll, I'll re reiterate. It's to draw out what is inside each of us, right? That's what the purpose is, to draw out what is inside all of us, the creativity, the spark, the insight, the knowledge of the universe <laughs> in that sense. That's what the purpose is. That's what it should be. Whether that is what it is, I don't know, but that's what it should be. There, there, I'll go, there's another philo philosophical thing, the is and the ought, right? <laughs> that's clearly what it ought to be. It ought to be about a drawing out. Well, I think that we'll wrap it right there, and why don't you stick around for just a few minutes after the interview, but tell us now the best way for our audience to get in touch with you. Well, this is an interesting point of fact, and the only ed class in the world, so it's pretty easy to find me. If you just Google ED space K-L-E-S-S, -S, you will find me, but it just very specifically – on Twitter, it's at Ed Kless, and if you want to send me an email, which I'm happy to do that, it's ed.kless at gmail.com. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ed. I really appreciate you taking some time to unpack some of that with our audience. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. If you've been enjoying the conversations and insights here on the podcast, share it with a friend. Great ideas demand to be shared. You can also help fellow parents and educators by subscribing to the Tabletop Inventing podcast in iTunes, leaving a rating, and writing a review. If you use Android, subscribe, leave us a rating, and write a review in Stitcher. Links to subscribe can be found at www.ttinvent.com slash podcast. Contact us, and we'll think through the comments and answer your questions here in the podcast. And be sure to let us know if you'd like a shout-out or to remain anonymous. You can share your comments and questions at www.ttinvent.com slash podcast or by emailing us at podcast at ttinvent.com. Let's discuss your thoughts and questions. Join us again next time when we will again seek to answer the question, what is the purpose of an education? And as educators, how do we awaken the inventor in each of our students? Mm -hmm.